Good morning. Welcome here. Uh, if you have a Bible, I invite you to turn to the book of Ruth. The book of Ruth. Uh, and if you don't have a Bible, there should be a Bible under the row of chairs in front of you. Uh, if you can grab a Bible, we're going to be in uh, Ruth chapter 4. Ruth chapter 4 this morning. Uh, next Sunday, as <coughs> Helena mentioned, uh, our family will be away at uh, Village Mission Staff Conference in Kelowna. So, um, yeah, we'll be leaving Wednesday, and uh, we will get back the following Thursday. Uh, so if you could be uh, praying for uh, safety in our travels there and back, uh, we would greatly appreciate it. Uh, this morning, we officially come to the end of what has been an incredible uh, sermon series on the gospel love story of Ruth. My, my hope has been that we would uh, see this as more than just uh, a love story between uh, a, a man and a woman, uh, although it is that. Don't get me wrong. It, it is the love story between a, a man and a woman, but it's also the love story between God and his people, uh, between God and, and his people. Uh, throughout the book of Ruth, we have seen uh, tragedy. We've seen tension. We've seen romance. Guys, I know you're excited about that. Uh, last week, we even saw that there was another guy in the picture, just to th throw a wrench into the, the mix. Uh, the book of Ruth has all the makings of a good love story, uh, but we've also been reminded uh, of the loyalty of God towards his covenant people, uh, the providence of God in ordaining all things for the good of his people and the praise of his glory and the, uh, the love of God in sending his son to be our shelter uh, from the wrath of God against sin. Uh, and this morning, uh, we are going to conclude our series by looking at the redemption of God, the redemption of God. Uh, as if there were not enough, you know, twists and turns in this book, uh, there's also a surprise ending that is so glorious and so hopeful for us today as we look at the redemption of God and, and kind of bring this book to a close. Uh, but just to recap the story in a nutshell, what we've looked at, uh, the curtain opens in Ruth chapter 1 with Elimelech and his wife Naomi and, uh, and their two sons as they uh, journey from Bethlehem to Moab uh, because there was a famine in Bethlehem. And when they get to Moab, suddenly Elimelech dies. And then Naomi's uh, two sons also suddenly die. And Naomi is left with uh, two Moabite daughters-in-law, uh, Orpah and Ruth. Uh, Naomi then hears that uh, Bethlehem is food again, uh, so she heads back home with her daughter-in-law, Ruth. And when they arrive in Bethlehem, Naomi feels as though uh, she's come back with nothing, even though she has Ruth by, by her side, and, uh, and that even God is against her. She's, she's dealing with this obvious, honest hurt. Uh, and then in Ruth chapter 2, we see that uh, these two women, Ruth and Naomi, are, are in need of uh, food, and they're in need of family. So Ruth goes out into the fields to glean and finds herself in the fields of Boaz, who uh, likes what he sees in Ruth. Uh, and Boaz uh, protects her, provides for her, and sends her home with enough grain for a year. And, uh, and while the need for food has obviously been met, there is still the need for family. The need for family that still is to be met. And this leads to Ruth chapter 3, where Naomi, who is getting you know, more and more excited as the, as the story goes on, uh, she devises a plan to get Ruth a husband. And the whole thing is just unbelievably sketchy. Uh, Naomi tells Ruth to get all dressed up, uh, go down to the threshing floor where Boaz was, and wait for him to fall asleep so that she can go and uncover his feet and lie down. Uh, essentially, this was Ruth proposing to Boaz, making her intentions very, very much known. Uh, and when Boaz wakes up, he's shocked that Ruth is there until she tells him why she's there. And then he's relieved because it means that Ruth isn't out, out you know, chasing after younger men. Uh, she wants to be with him. Uh, and just when you think, you know, that's the end of the story where uh, Boaz and Ruth will live happily ever after. They're going to ride off into the sunset. Uh, there's this big letdown. And, uh, and Bo Boaz tells Ruth that there is uh, another guy, another relative uh, nearer than him. Uh, who has the potential of redeeming Ruth. And so uh, the answer to the need for family is still up in the air. Uh, who will be the one to redeem Ruth? Will it be Boaz or will it be uh, this other guy? Uh, and this brings us to Ruth chapter 4. 
And just like what we've done throughout this series, we're going to break it, break the passage down section by section so that we're able to, to understand uh, really what's, what's going on uh, in this, this passage of scripture. Uh, but let's look at Ruth chapter four, verse one. Now Boaz had gone up to the gate and sat down there. And behold, the Redeemer, of whom Boaz had spoken, came by. So Boaz said, Turn aside, friend, sit down here. And he turned aside and sat down. Uh, Now you'll notice in this verse the word Redeemer, or kinsman, as some translations say. Uh, The word used in the original language is goel. Goel. And uh, we've seen it used in a number of... seen it used a number of times in its various forms uh, throughout this story. But this one Hebrew word, which is, uh, which we take, you know, two English words to, uh, to explain it, uh, gives us a twofold picture of what is commonly called the kinsman redeemer. The kinsman redeemer. The, the kinsman was the nearest adult male relative to someone. So for example, in order to be a, the kinsman uh, to Naomi and Ruth, you would need to be the nearest adult male relative to Elimelech and his sons. Uh, But the other word there, the other word is uh, redeemer. Uh, That means that that kinsman would have the right, if he was willing, uh, to purchase the property that belonged to Elimelech and his sons. Uh, Now, if you turn back in your Bibles to Leviticus chapter 25, uh, Leviticus chapter 25, God had set up a way uh, for the land that God had given his people to be redeemed by relatives uh, in the case of disastrous or tragic circumstances. Uh, and in Leviticus chapter 25, verse 23, uh, it says, The land shall not be sold in perpetuity, for the land is mine. This is God speaking. Uh, for you are strangers and sojourners with me. And in all the country you possess, you shall allow a redemption of the land. What does that mean? Verse 25, if your brother becomes poor and sells part of his property, then his nearest redeemer shall come and redeem what his brother has sold. Same word used there. If a man has no one to redeem it, and then himself becomes prosperous and finds sufficient means to redeem it, let him calculate the years since he sold it, and pay back the balance to the man to whom he sold it, and then, and then return to his property. Uh, in those days, uh, land was everything. It, uh, it was very, very important to uh, the Jewish people. And, and so if, if land was lost because of something like uh, famine or poverty or death, uh, there, there was a means whereby a kinsman, a redeemer, could come and redeem that land, where the land would be kept within the family, or at the very least, kept within uh, the clan, which was a a larger group of a whole bunch of families. Uh, But then flip ahead to Deuteronomy chapter 25. Deuteronomy chapter 25. Uh, We looked at this a little bit back in the the first sermon in this series. Uh, God had set up a way for a widow uh, to be cared for in the event of the death of her husband. And here's what uh, Deuteronomy chapter 25, verse 5 says. If brothers dwell together and one of them dies and has no son, the wife of the dead man shall not be married outside the family to a stranger. Her husband's brother shall go into her and take her as his wife and perform the duty of a husband's brother to her. And the first son whom she bears shall succeed to the name of his dead brother, that his name may not be blotted out of Israel. Now we need to understand uh, that this was uh, extremely sacrificial on the part of the living brother because he was giving up his name for the sake of his dead brother, that his line uh, may be carried out through him. Uh, But then look at how serious it was if the man did not do this in verses 7 to 10. It says, And if the man does not wish to take his brother's wife, then his brother's wife shall go up to the gate to the elders and say, My husband's brother refuses to uh, 
perpetuate, yes, there we go, I can read, uh, perpetuate uh, his brother's name in Israel. Uh, He will not perform the duty of a husband's brother to me. Then the elders of the city shall call him and speak to him. And if he persists, saying, I do not wish to take her, then his brother's wife shall go up to him in the presence of the elders and pull his sandal off his foot and spit in his face. And she shall answer and say, so shall it be done to the man who does not build up his brother's house. And the name of the house and the name of his house shall be called in Israel the house of him who had his sandal pulled off. Now, it sounds kind of, uh, kind of bizarre, uh, but it's, just, it pointed, it's pointing out just the serious nature uh, of providing for your family and the families within your clan by keeping uh, the land, one, in the family, and then maintaining the family name, two. Uh, so as we come to Ruth chapter four, we have this picture of the kinsman redeemer, an adult male relative who is closest to Elimelech, Uh, who has the right to redeem the land and take in this family. Uh, We see that Boaz sits down by the gate, and this guy, this relative, comes by, and Boaz asks him to come sit down because there's a serious matter that they need to discuss. Look at verse 2. And he took ten men of the elders of the city and said, Sit down here. So they sat down. Then he said to the redeemer, Naomi who has come back from the country of Moab is selling the parcel of land that belonged to our relative Elimelech. So I thought I would tell you of it and say, buy it in the presence of those sitting here and in the presence of the elders of my people. If you will redeem it, redeem it. But if you will not, tell me that I may know, for there is no one besides you to redeem it, and I come after you. And so the elders here, he gathers together these, these 10 elders. The elders here are basically witnesses to a transaction. They're there to make sure that everyone is held accountable for, uh, for their part in this transaction. Uh, and what Boaz is offering the Redeemer is the, uh, in, the, in the presence of these elders uh, is the land that currently belongs to Naomi. Remember, land uh, was everything. Naomi is wanting to sell the land to the the kinsman redeemer, the nearest male relative who is willing to redeem it in order to keep the land and the family. Now, it sounds like a really good deal for the the redeemer, right? He's he's getting this land that he can use to uh, grow more crops and then uh, even, you know, pass on to to his children uh, when he's, you know, old and wants to keep it in the family, obviously. Uh, and, And all that's really being required of him in return is his willingness to provide for and protect Naomi, uh, who is past the age of childbearing. So he doesn't even need to worry about the whole uh, carrying on her family line thing or or anything like that. All he's basically thinking about is is this land. Uh, Boaz lays this offer out on a a silver platter, essentially. It it doesn't get any sweeter than this. And it causes the Redeemer to respond in verse 4, I will redeem it. I will redeem it. And we're all thinking, of of course he's going to redeem it, Boaz. What were you thinking, offering it to him so easily? You you made him an offer that he couldn't refuse. Uh, we, we, We don't want this other guy to redeem it. We want you to redeem it, Boaz. We want you to be the guy who redeems Ruth, not this other guy. Because with this guy, the reality is, with this guy agreeing to redeem the land and the, the family of of Elimelech, he would also be agreeing to take in Ruth as well. And so, I mean, if we ended the book right here, it would seem as though Boaz was giving up on his future with Ruth. But thankfully, Boaz knows what he's doing. Uh, Look at verse 5. Then Boaz said, The day you buy the field from the hand of Naomi, you also acquire Ruth, the Moabite the widow of the dead, in order to perpetuate the name of the dead in his inheritance. In other words, Boaz is saying, oh, I I almost forgot. When you redeem this land from Naomi, you also redeem Ruth. You you know Ruth, right? Uh, Naomi's daughter-in-law, whose husband died while they were in Moab. 
Well, you see, they, they never had any children of their own. So uh, if you bring Ruth into your family, then you have the responsibility of, of providing her with children. Isn't that great? This is essentially how that's, that's coming out. And then, then all of a sudden, right, this isn't as great a deal as the Redeemer originally thought that it would be. Uh, he was not expecting a young widow to be part of the package, and that is maybe because he had a wife and children of his own or because Ruth was a Moabite and there would be a stigma attached to her that uh, he didn't want to bring into his home. Whatever the case, the Redeemer says in verse 6, you know what, on second thought, I can't actually redeem that. I, I cannot redeem it for myself lest, lest I impair my own inheritance. Take my rights of redemption yourself for I cannot redeem it. And this is really the moment that we've all been waiting for since, you know, Ruth chapter one, because it, it means that Boaz is now the rightful redeemer of the land and of Naomi and Ruth. The, the need for food has uh, been taken care of. And now the need for family has just been taken care of. Every, everything is finally falling into place. Verse seven. Now, this was the custom in former times in Israel concerning redeeming and exchanging. To confirm a transaction, uh, the one drew off his sandal and gave it to the other. And this was the manner of attesting in Israel. So the, when the Redeemer said to Boaz, buy it for yourself, he drew off his sandal. Now, do you remember what happened to the man who did not fulfill the duty of taking his dead brother's wife and carrying on the, the family line through him? The, the dead brother's wife would pull the man's sandal off and spit in his face, and the name of his house was to be called the, the house of him who had his sandal pulled off, which would have been extremely shameful in that culture, right? We don't see any of that here. Rather, what we see is the, the yielding of the right to redeem the land and Ruth and Naomi, the yielding of that right to Boaz. And Boaz... Boaz wastes no time in, in claiming that right to redeem. Look at verse 9. Then Boaz said to the elders and all the people, You are witnesses this day that I have brought from the hand of Naomi all that belonged to Elimelech and all that belonged to Kilion and to Malon, and also Ruth the Moabite, the widow of Malon. I have bought to be my wife, to perpetuate the name of the dead in his inheritance, that the name of the dead may not be cut off from among his brothers and from the gate of his native place. You are witnesses this day. Then all the people who were at the gate and the elders said, we are witnesses. May the Lord make the woman who is coming into your house like Rachel and Leah, who together built up the house of Israel. May you act worthily in Ephrathah and to be renowned in Bethlehem. And may your house be like the house of Perez, whom Tamar bore to Judah because of the offspring that the Lord will give you by this young woman. Notice here how... Ruth is described throughout the book. We, we see this progression. Uh, she's called a Moabite. Uh, she's called a foreigner. She's called a servant. Earlier in chapter 4, she's called a widow. And now here in chapter 4, verse 10, she is called wife. She's called wife. So do, do you see the progression? Remember, Moabite women were known for their sexual immorality and idolatry. And, and here you have a Moabite woman essentially breaking free from that stigma as she is recognized finally as a member of Israel. And this is realized fully in the blessing of the elders upon Boaz and, and Ruth. Uh, the reference here to, to Rachel and Leah uh, is particularly interesting as these two women, like Ruth, uh, were barren at one time before God opened uh, their womb. 
But between Rachel and Leah, they bore nine children. And, and here is this Moabite woman being prayed over uh, that God would be faithful to build up his people Israel by granting Ruth, uh, this Moabite, this foreigner, this servant, that same kind of fertility. Okay, so that, that's, uh, that's amazing. And then, and then this reference to Tamar is yet another one of those, those instances where God used a woman outside of Israel— uh, in this case, Canaan, to carry on the line of Israel. Uh, so that's, that's instance number one. And then Boaz's mom is actually Rahab. And you might know, know who Rahab is. She's the, the, the prostitute in Jericho who helped the, the Israelite spies uh, when they were scouting out the land. So you have you know, Tamar, you've got Rahab, and now you've got Ruth. Uh, over and over again, we just see God at work uh, bringing in these, these women from outside of the covenant and, and grafting them into the people of Israel and carrying on the line through them. And I mean, God did that with Jesus by grafting all of us into uh, his covenant people. But here we continue to see God at work in verse 13. So Boaz took Ruth and she became his wife. And he went into her and the Lord gave her conception as she bore a son. Now notice this. In, in chapter 1, verse 6, we see that God takes care of the need for food. As Naomi hears that the Lord had visited his people and given them food. And then here in chapter 4, verse 13, we see that God, again, uh, takes care of the need for family as it's the Lord who gives her conception and she bears a son. So don't, don't miss this. At the, at the forefront of this entire story, fr from beginning to end, is God. The, the narrator isn't leaving any of this up to debate or question. It's the Lord who met the needs of food and family in the lives of Ruth and Naomi. It's the Lord who gives and, and takes away. And it's the Lord who is able to meet the deepest needs of each one of us in this room. It's the Lord. And it's how, how the, the women can say to Naomi in verse 14, Blessed be the Lord. Blessed be the Lord who has not left you this day without a redeemer and may his name be renowned in Israel. He shall be to you a restorer of life and a nourisher of your old age. For your daughter-in-law who loves you, who is more to you than seven sons, has given birth to him. Now, if you think about where, where Naomi was at, at the end of Ruth chapter one, she arrived back in Bethlehem, bitter, alone, with no husband and no sons, blaming God for all of her misfortune. All she had was her daughter-in-law. And now these women are pointing Naomi to this child whom her daughter-in-law has just born and whom God provided to be the hope for her and the hope for each one of us here today. And here's why. Verse 16. Then Naomi took the child and laid him on her lap and became his nurse. And the women of the neighborhood gave him a name, saying, A son has been born to Naomi. They named him Obed. He was the father of Jesse, the father of David. Now these are the generations of Perez. So it goes back to, to Perez here. Perez fathered Hezron. Hezron fathered Ram. Ram fathered Aminadab. Aminadab fathered Nashon. Nashon fathered Salmon. Salmon fathered Boaz, Boaz fathered Obed, Obed fathered Jesse, and Jesse fathered David. You see this beautiful genealogy. The, the reason why uh, this son of Ruth and Boaz will be a restorer of life and a redeemer, and his name uh, renowned in Israel is because of who that son points us to. Their son, Obed, eventually leads us to David, who eventually leads us to Jesus. If you look at the genealogy in, in Matthew chapter 1, and, and Jesus is our ultimate kinsman redeemer. And, and so there, there's the surprise ending that, that I don't think we would have seen coming if we didn't already know that it was coming. That, that there's this genealogy that Ruth herself finds 
herself in. You see, there, there, are, there are two things required to be a, a kinsman redeemer. Actually, I was, I was talking on the phone with, with Elwood uh, yesterday, and um, he mentioned that there were uh, three things uh, required to be a, a kinsman redeemer. I really liked those. Uh, but, you know, for our purposes this, this morning, I just kind of like whittled it down to, to two. And, and really it just shows that, um, you know, if, if you're looking at, at these passages of Scripture, like I'm not exhaustively uh, going through all of this. So if you find uh, tidbits that are, you know, more than what I pull out of, that's excellent. That's awesome. Do that. You know, read the passage ahead so that you're able to, uh, to pull out these things. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Elwood um, pulled out that there were, you know, three things required to be a kinsman redeemer. Here are the two that, that I um, nailed down. Number one, you had to have the right to redeem. You had to have the right to redeem. Boaz did not have the right to redeem until the rightful kinsman redeemer yielded his right to Boaz. Only then could Boaz obtain the right to redeem Ruth. But you see, Jesus, on the other hand, Jesus is the only one who has the right to redeem sinful and fallen humanity. Jesus became like one of us, yet without sin. He is fully God and fully man. He, he's the only righteous one. There, there has been no one in all of human history who has had the right to redeem except Christ alone. Now picture this, Jesus would take off his shoe, so to speak, like Boaz, and he would acknowledge the obligation of the Redeemer. He would pay the price standing in the sinner's place, offering up himself instead. This is the rightful redemption of God. It was the plan of God from the beginning to redeem us for himself, to redeem a people for himself. And it has been extended to sinful humanity with no conditions on our part. We cannot earn it. We cannot work for it. It's offered to us by grace. And so the kinsman redeemer needed to have the right to redeem. We see that Jesus has the right to redeem. But the kinsman redeemer also needed to have the resolve to redeem. He needed to have the right to redeem, but he also needed the resolve to redeem. When the, the rightful redeemer of the land and of, of Ruth and Naomi heard that, that Ruth was part of the deal, he backed out, right? He, he didn't want to impair his own inheritance by bringing uh, Ruth into his home. And, and so Boaz calls together the elders of the city to witness his acknowledgement of the responsibility of the redeemer. He was going to accept that. But here's the good news about Jesus. Jesus didn't shrink back when we were part of the deal. I mean, if you think about the Moabites and the kind of people they were in God's economy, we're just as evil as they are, just as sinful and just as in need. Each one of us has sinned, therefore we all fall short of the glory of God. And yet Jesus took up a wooden cross, and not just a cross, but your sin and my sin, the wrath of God against sin that was coming our way, he took upon himself, not because he was obligated to, not because he felt that he had to, but because he had desired obedience to the Father more than he desired his life. Okay, that's our Savior. Jesus did not consider us an, an, an impairment to his inheritance as Son of God. Praise God for that. But rather, he welcomed us to receive an inheritance as adopted sons and daughters of God and co-heirs, get that, co-heirs with Christ. Jesus is our rightful and willing kinsman redeemer. And the good news of the gospel is that if we confess that Jesus is Lord and believe that God raised this same Jesus from the dead, we will be saved. We will be redeemed. And trust me, we need to be redeemed. We do. It's not, it's not like we, we are exactly Ruth in this story. You know, we're, we're out gleaning in the field until God sees us and likes what he sees. There is nothing in us that is drawing holy God to us. Isaiah 53, verse 6, All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him, Jesus, the iniquity of us all. In our natural state, we want nothing to do with God. 
We, we want nothing to do with God. And yet, God pursues us and desires relationship with us, not because of anything redeemable in us, but because of everything in God who is redeeming. Because he is a redeeming God. I mean, look at Ruth. Look at Ruth's situation. A Moabite was a link in the lineage through which a, our, our kinsman redeemer entered the world. This should amaze us because according to Deuteronomy 23, verse 3, the Moabites weren't even able to, to enter the assembly of the Lord for like 10 generations. And this simply reveals the, the redeeming nature of God. It doesn't matter how far from God you think you are, God is willing and able to rescue you by his grace. Church, the good news of Jesus Christ is that there is nothing that you have done or that I have done that cannot be fully redeemed in Christ. There's just nothing. Tragedy. Loss. Walking away from the faith. Loneliness. Despair. Bitterness. Anger. Barrenness. Sexual immorality, idolatry. Look at Ruth chapter 1 and then Ruth chapter 4 and tell me that all these things cannot be fully redeemed in Christ. I mean, that's, that's the hope that we have. That's the hope that we have. And don't get me wrong, I'm not saying that, that all these things will be re re redeemed on this side of glory. Not necessarily. Although if God sees fit to redeem these now, he will. But I, but I am saying that there is coming a day when even these things that don't get resolved here on earth will be resolved when Christ returns. In that day, all will be made right, for sure and for certain. And that's what I'm holding on to. I hope that's what you're holding on to as well. I mean, I, I have an eye disease that's causing me to go blind. I'm holding on to the hope that God will redeem that here on earth but that even if it, he doesn't, he is still the rightful and willing kinsman redeemer of my eyesight where my eyes will be fully restored in heaven. That day is coming. That's the hope that I have. And so whatever your hardship, if you have declared that Jesus is your Lord and your Savior, the best truly is still to come. The best is still to come. That's a promise. That's a promise. Whether, whether your hardship is that you don't have enough money coming in or you have lost your job or uh, you're having marital problems or problems with children or problems with grandchildren or problems with your relatives or uh, you're unable to have children or you, you work with difficult people or you're working away from home, or you're struggling uh, with the work you need to do, or, or you uh, are struggling with something like uh, anxiety or depression or some kind of um, mental state, what, whatever it is, it's not unredeemable. It's not unredeemable. It's all redeemable in Christ. Uh, this past week, the, the state of Alabama passed a law uh, banning all abortions at any point during gestation, except in cases where uh, the woman's life is in danger. And so, I mean, that, that, that is certainly a win for pro-life. But the reality is that there are still millions of abortions performed all over the world. That's just the reality. And yet, and yet... <laughs> Even this will one day be redeemed when Christ returns. Even, even the obsceneness of abortion has been nailed to the cross of Jesus Christ. Or he will redeem even that. So do we believe this? Do we truly believe this? Do we believe that the best is still to come? Do we believe that it's the Lord who meets our deepest needs? Or are we still trying to meet our own needs, doing things our own way and our own power and ability, trying to be our own Lord and Savior? Do we truly believe it? As many of you probably know, uh, Helena and I have a heart for 
uh, the, the Pregnancy Care Center. Uh, they, they do an amazing work. They're an amazing organization. Um, they, they deal with women uh, facing unplanned pregnancies, giving them the support, the resources, and the counseling they need to walk through this challenging time in, in their life. Uh, we are firm believers in protecting life in the womb, and, and, uh, and so we, we support this organization. And we're so glad that we have the opportunity to participate uh, with them in their baby bottle campaign that we have going on and from you know, now until Father's Day. Um, there, there are still bottles at the back table that we need to, to fill up with, with cash or coins or a check um, so that we can support the amazing work that the Pregnancy Care Center is, is doing. So I just share that as, as kind of an application point of, of, uh, of the redeeming work of Christ or what we have rede- been redeemed from and to. But just as we bring, bring our series on route to a close, if, if, you were, if you're here and you're not a follower of Jesus, if you have never made that profession of faith in Jesus, I just, I just want to encourage you with the good news that you have a uh, kinsman redeemer who has chosen freely and willingly to redeem broken humanity. Freely and willingly. And, and if you want to know more about that, you can talk with my, myself or one of the elders, Elwood, Fred, uh, after the service, we would love to walk you through making that commitment to Jesus today. Uh, and if you are not a follower of Jesus, I just want to encourage you that if you are a follower of Jesus, I just want to encourage you that, that your inheritance has been purchased. The work has been accomplished. And you are invited to receive and enjoy the blessings of being a child of the most high God. So may the truth that the best is still to come give you the hope for today and tomorrow and every day. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your redemption of us. Uh, We are so fallen and so broken and so in need and it's honestly astounding that you would send your son to redeem us uh the price was was way too high in our estimation but in your your perfect wisdom and sovereignty you saw fit to save us by your grace god help us to look beyond the worldly affections that compete for our hearts in this life god raise our eyes towards you that we realize that we were created for something much greater than anything the world has to offer, that, that we were created to be part of the, the grand redemptive narrative where you are making your glory known in every tongue, tribe, and nation through your people. It is too glorious a reality for us to be part of. And so we, we thank you for this, this great salvation. God, we are an ordinary people with an extraordinary God. You have sent us out on mission for your kingdom. We, we pray that this truth would sink down deep and that it would give us extraordinary purpose in the day-to-day as we go to work and as we interact with our family members, as we interact with our coworkers, as we interact with those we meet on the streets, and, and just, God, as we await the best that is still to come. May you be glorified in our words and in our actions. In the precious name of Jesus, I pray. Amen.